the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Take your Bible, if you will, and let's look together at 1 Kings chapter number 2. 1 Kings chapter number 2, if you will, here on this uh, 2019 Father's Day. Um, David is old and he's cold. They had brought in a bunch of blankets and stacked them up on top of him to try to warm him up. He's freezing to death. And uh, that didn't work. So they brought a woman in, beautiful woman, and uh, not for any other purpose except just to warm him up. And that warmed him up and the blood started circulating again. And he is uh, basically dying. And uh, he's calling in Solomon. And he wants Solomon close by him. Little did David know that he had a real problem in Adonijah, his other son, who had uh, decided that he wanted to be king, and so he's crowning himself king, throwing himself a big old party, and uh, some of the people weren't invited. Solomon wasn't, everybody was invited, but Solomon wasn't invited, and neither was Nathan, uh, the uh, preacher, the anointed man of God, he wasn't invited. But Adonijah was throwing this huge party. Bathsheba found out about it. So she told David, David, uh, <laughs> your boy's not doing well. He's out there um, crowning himself king. And we know that that's not the will of God. God's already ordained Solomon that he should be king. So the blood circulating now in his body. Once again, he gets up off the bed, brings Solomon in, and he declares him to be king. Zadok the priest comes in and, and really um, kind of verifies everything and anoints him uh, with oil. And then they get a marketing scheme and they send out word all over Israel that um, David has anointed Solomon king over all of Israel. Now, David again is dying. And he's giving some, uh, I've kind of named the message this morning, a father's advice to a son. So he brings in Solomon and he said, now Solomon, I'm, I'm dying, but I got a few things that I want to say to you before I die. What, what would you say if you knew you only had just a short time to live? Uh, fathers, what would you say to your kids? How, how would you convey your last word? What, what would you want to get across? What would you want your kids to remember about those final moments that they had with their daddy? Well, you could spread that out and say, Mamas, same thing for you. What would you want your kids to know? Well, we're going to be looking at that passage right now, if you would, in 1 Kings chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong therefore and show thyself a man and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses that thou mayest prosper in all that thou dost and whithersoever thou turnest thyself that the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. I don't know of a more appropriate text that we could choose today on this Father's Day than 1 Kings chapter number 2. The context of the passage is a powerful one that is extremely appropriate today. So he says to Solomon, he says, be strong, be courageous, be a man. Now we're facing probably some of the most critical battles 
and conflicts that we've ever faced in our culture. I just came back from the Southern Baptist Convention and uh, I declare, I believe it's a more fierce battle in our convention now than it was back in 1979 when we were fighting for the uh, authority of scriptures. I, I believe we're facing as formidable a giant today as we were back then. We're facing enemies that are seeking to destroy our families. We're facing conflicts now that are seeking to destroy uh, us as we know in the family of God. You say, well, preacher, uh, I just believe that if you're a Christian, uh, you're already strong. Well, I, I wish it was as simple as that kind of statement. I, I wish it were um, that as you say that is, it's really not how it works, frankly. Uh, when you become a child of God, the strength is there but until you learn how to appropriate that strength, until you learn how to clothe yourself uh, in that strength, uh, then you're never ever going to realize what it means to be strong in the Lord. And until you do learn how to appropriate it and how to clothe yourself in the strength of the Lord, you're gonna go down like a heap. You're not gonna make it. Will you say, well, preacher, how do, I, how, do I, how do I appropriate the strength of the Lord? How, how do I clothe myself? How, how can I be strong uh, in the Lord? Well, I, I think that there's some ways here in this passage uh, that are pretty clear, and I want to make them clear or to you if I could. Notice what he says, the first one here, is be strong in the obedience to God's command. Watch it now again. There is strength via obedience in verse number two. I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore. Show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, like the law of Moses, that you may, watch this, that you may prosper in all that you do, whether you ever, whichever direction that you go in, uh, in your life. He says, observe the commands of God. Walk in the things of the Lord in all of his ways, in all of his decrees. Here's just the bottom line. If you want to be strong, if you want to be courageous, if you want to be a person of God, the bottom line of all of it is do what God says to do. Just obey the Lord. Here on this Father's Day, there may be many of you men that are sitting here saying, I want to be strong for my family. Then be strong through, via obedience. One of the biggest and most constant prayers that I pray in my life, I'm just confessing up to you, one of the most consistent and prayers that I lift up to the Lord, Lord, really, I want to be strong in you. I want to be consistent. I want to be more disciplined in my walk with you. And, and inevitably, the Spirit of God always brings me back to this essential issue. He says, well, if you want to be strong, then just do what I tell you to do. Just obey me. Just walk with me. Be sensitive to my word, if you will. You understand that there's all kinds of words that just lift itself out of this. There, there's prosperity uh, there is victory and there's success that he says will come to every one of us as we obey the word of God. I, I want you to turn with me uh, back toward Genesis just a minute to the book of Joshua. Look at the, the first chapter of the book of Joshua, if you will. And I want you to pick it up in verse number six. Joshua 1 verse six. Listen what he says. Be strong and of good courage. Unto this people shalt thou divide an inheritance, the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do everything according to my law, which Moses my servant commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper whithersoever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. 
for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage? Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Did you pick up on those words? Prosperity, success. You see it all the way through the passage. Now here's what the world says. Here's what the secular media, and by the way, if you want to go down to the state institutions and go to school there, here's what they're going to tell you. They're going to say, you spell success with S-U-C-E dollar sign, dollar sign. And that is that you've got to go to the right school to get the right kind of education so that you can secure the right kind of job so that you can make those six-figure numbers or better that are out there so you can drive the right kind of car and dress in the right kind of clothing so that you can exude success. But that's not what God says. That may be what the world says. That may be what the media is trying to convince you of. But the Bible says that if you really want to be a successful person, stay true to the word of God. Obey the word. Trust the word. Hide the word in your heart. Live out the word. And you will find that kind of success. Here's, here's the issue. Somewhere along the way, you've got to decide whose standards that you're going to live by. You're going to live by the standards of the world or you're going to live by the standards of God. I chose a long time ago that I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to live according to his word. I, I, I know you all remember my series on 1 John some time ago, but here's what 1 John 2 and 3 says. He says, this is the way that people will know that you are a believer. Here's the way that you can know that you're a believer. Here's the way that you can know that you have turned from death to life and go to heaven when you die if you keep my commandments, if you're walking in the Lord. Now, hear my heart a minute. I am not just talking about the external trappings of not doing the don'ts and doing the do's. There's a lot of people that I know that outwardly, they have it all together. They could come to church, they give of their tithes, they wouldn't dare miss. And, and, and outwardly, you'd think that they have it all together. But inwardly, it's really not there. You, you understand, it's not about the outward external appearances, it's about the sincerity of your heart, it's what's on the inside that really matters. I heard about a mama who had this little boy. He was quite rebellious. And uh, she told him one day, said, now, uh, Robbie, I want you to sit down over there right now. He says, no, Robbie, I said, I want you to sit down right now in that chair. He says, no. She goes over and gets him by the shoulders and plops him down in that chair. She told him to sit down in and walked away and he said, well, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside. I know a lot of people like that. Outwardly, they got it all together, but inwardly, there's still a huge amount of self-pride that's keeping them from being who God wants you to be. If you want to be strong, if you want to be courageous, if you want the blessings of God to pour out on your life, God says, keep my word. Let me give you number two. If you want to be strong, you're strong by trusting in God's power and not your own. Now, I want you to take your Bible. Look with me to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. And I want you to look at verse five. I'll give you just a minute. Jeremiah chapter 17. And look with me, if you will, at verse five. Here's a, a major contrast. In verse 5, he says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like a heath or a bush in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. He said, if you want a good description of a guy 
who is trusting in himself and is gonna live in barrenness, right here it is. But then, now watch the contrast in verse seven. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat comes, but her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So there it is. Here's the picture of a person who's trusting in themselves and a different picture of a person who's trusting in God. So the question this morning is, who are you going to trust? Who are you going to put your faith? Look with me, if you will, at Psalm 33. Go on over just a little further with me to uh, back toward Genesis in Psalm uh, 23, excuse me, Psalm 33. And, and I want you to see verse 16. Psalm 33 and uh, verse number 16. The Bible says, There is no king saved by the multitude of a host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety, neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in him. His holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in you. Do you get it? Shake your head like that right there. Just let me know that you're listening. Do, do, do you understand? So where is your confidence? Where is your hope? Where is the confidence of your strength? Where is the source of your strength? Where is the source of your success? Where is the source of your prosperity? It better not be in your own ability. It better not be in your own intellect. It better not be in your own strength. It better be in the Lord. I think about Apostle Paul when he went up to Corinth and uh, he, he, he said to them, uh, I didn't come up here with enticing words and in my intellect. I can just see as Paul got up to Corinth and, and he went out and pitched up his tent up there and went out and preached one night and two Corinthians got together and said, well, what'd you think about the evangelist? What, what'd you think about his preaching? Uh, he, he was a little bit dumpy and bald headed and, uh, and, and really had bad eyesight and couldn't see very well. And, 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 but you know, what, what'd you think about his preaching life? But Paul then counters with that. And he says, hey guys, I didn't come up here to really cause you to swoon over my ability to articulate the word. I came up here in the power of God's spirit and in the power of God's might and not my own. You know, we've often heard it said, we look at these uh, big athletes, some of these folks on the Dallas Cowboys, maybe down in the Houston Texans. We look at the Carolina Panthers and we, we see these amazing athletes and we say, boy, if we could just get them to Jesus, what a powerhouse for God that they could be. Or we see somebody that's rich and famous, got a lot of influence and we have great admiration for them and we say, man, if we could just get them saved, Man alive, would they do great things for God. That's the dumbest approach that I've ever heard, I think, in my life. It's just not the way God works. The Bible lets us know that God does his most incredible work through hmm, clods like you and me, a, a bunch of no names when they realize that they don't have much in and of themselves, but what they do have, they have submitted unto the Lord himself. And because of that, God did powerful and mighty things. It's not about your power. It's not about your charm. It's not about your intellect. It's not about your abilities. It's about leaning on God. I think about Paul again when Paul had that thorn in his flesh and he asked the Lord three times, get rid of this. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. You understand 
that we bring our weakness unto God and his strength is made perfect through our weakness. And if you feel like today that you're a nobody, that you're a misfit, that you're a no talent, that you're inept, congratulations. You're a person that God could use mightily for his glory and his honor. In Psalm 107, there's a passage of scripture in there somewhere around uh, verse 20, 23, somewhere along in there. He says, I, I staggered around uh, like a drunkard and I just came, he uses this phrase, I love the phrase, I just came to my wit's end. You ever been to your wit's end? How many of you have been to your wit's end? And he says, it was then that God became my strength and brought me out of my troubles. I don't know where this came from. I'll just read it for you for a minute. He says, are you standing at wit's end corner, Christian, with troubled brow? Are you thinking of what is before you and all you're bearing now? Does all the world seem against you and you in the battle alone? Remember, at wit's end corner is where God's power is shown. Are you standing at wit's end corner, blinded with wearying pain, feeling you cannot endure it, you cannot bear the strain? Bruised through the constant suffering, dizzy and dazed and numb. Remember, at wit's end corner is where Jesus loves to come. Are you standing at wit's end corner? Your work before you spread? Or lying begun, unfinished, and pressing on your heart and head? Longing for strength to do it, stretching out trembling hands? Remember, at wit's end corner, the burden bearer stands. Are you standing at wit's end corner, yearning for those you love, longing and praying and watching, pleading their cause above, trying to lead them to Jesus, wondering if you've been true? He whispers at wit's end corner, I'll win them as I won you. Are you standing at wit's end corner? Then you're just in the very spot to learn the wondrous resources of him who faileth not. No doubt to a brighter pathway, your footsteps will soon be moved but only at wit's end corner is the God who is able proved. You want to be strong? David says to Solomon. You want to be strong, David? David says, you want to be strong, Solomon? Solomon says, how? Well, when at wit's end corner, by placing your weakness into his hands, that his power and his strength could be made perfect. Let me give you number three. Be strong, and I won't stay long here, but be strong by being with God's people. Turn over to Hebrews chapter number 10, if you will. Hebrews chapter 10. There's a wonderful passage of scripture there that I'm gonna to get to in my study in Hebrews here pretty quickly. But in chapter 10, I want you to see with me, beginning in verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. One of my dear friends is with us today, Brother Jerry. And, and Brother Jerry has seen this numerous times in his ministry. I, I'm watching it now probably more than ever before. There is a new move in modern evangelicalism that says, you know, I don't really need the church. I can serve God right in my own little world out here. I don't need to be faithful on Sunday mornings. I, I don't need to be around other believers. I can manage it all by myself. And I am watching uh, this falling away. I am watching, watching this independent mindset to uh, uh, grab hold of people that says, I, I just don't need all. All I need is Jesus. Hmm. Now, Listen to me, listen to me very carefully. Don't want you to hear anything else. I do believe with all of my heart and soul and mind in the sufficiency of Christ. 
But I can tell you this, you need other believers too. You see, this world is buying into a lie of the devil himself that says that all you need is Jesus. You don't need those people down there. You don't need that life group. You don't need that assembly. I want to tell you, friend, you need the fellowship of other believers. And if you don't have it, I promise you this, you won't make it spiritually. You won't survive. The Bible tells us right here that we need to stir one another up. We need to spur one another on. Do you know that the New Testament is filled with the one another business? 33 times in the New Testament alone, that little phrase is said, one another, encourage one another, pray for one another, admonish one another, lift one another up. The Bible on and on, on and on and on. 33 times in the New Testament, there is the one another ministry. Yesterday, by the way, <laughs> of those 33 times, you can't fulfill that unless you're around one another. Yesterday, I, I, was, I was putting together and getting ready with, with a new um, barbecue uh, what do you, grill. It's a Traeger. And I had to spend two hours just seasoning the thing. And, and there was a step in there. I think it was like step number 422 in that process. But, but there was a step in there that I had to let it cool down. Well, the, the pellets in there were on fire and blazing up. And I thought, well, how in the world is it going to cool down with that fire burning in there? I waited and waited and waited and it just kept on flaming. So I said, I've got to do something about this. And I went into the kitchen and I got me a big old spoon and I just dipped it down into those pellets. And I noticed when I put that spoon and I pulled it out that that fire went way down when I separated some of those pellets from the others. And I shook it in that spoon just a little bit. And you know what? The flames went completely out. And then I threw them up into the air down onto the ground and they turned black as they could be and cold in a matter of a minute. I'm telling you, that's exactly the way it is with the body of Christ. I've watched people all my ministry that are so on fire for the Lord and they'll start missing here and they'll miss there and they'll stay out here and they'll go this and Sunday no longer becomes important to them. Life group no longer becomes important to them and they start absencing themselves from the gathering of other believers and before you know it, they have grown cold spiritually. I, I want to tell you something. Here, here's my heart. This is as transparent as I know how to be. I've been saved since 1970. I've been preaching the Word of God since 1973, pastoring since 1976. I can tell you right now, I would quit bearing fruit. My testimony would wane, and my walk with God would be reduced greatly if I got away from the body of Christ. After all, friends, this is the bride of Christ. And one of these days, he's coming back after his bride. Why wouldn't I want to be a part of that? Now, you're all here on a Father's Day, and thank God for you, and I'm grateful. But is it going to last? How long is it going to last? I want to be here when Jesus comes. Let me give you number four, and we'll close with this. Be strong by wholehearted devotion to God. Go back now to 1 Kings. Go back to 1 Kings in that second chapter. I want you to look at verse 4. That the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me. If thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, I'll make sure that we'll have a king on the throne of Israel. <laughs> Pretty powerful words, isn't it? Now, to get the rest of the story, I don't know why it's like this, but it's the same setting. David is still talking to Solomon from his deathbed, giving him some final words. Go over to 1 Chronicles with me, if you will, and in chapter 28, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, and let's see the rest of the story in verse 9. 
And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart, with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Isn't it amazing that we'll come to the invitation time and we'll sing, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, but as long as it doesn't inconvenience me. And we'll sing songs, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee on Sundays. But on Monday, I, I don't know that I can follow through. There was an interview in 1984, I believe it was in 1985, somewhere with the owner of McDonald's. And they asked him the question, what do you believe? He said, I believe in God, I believe in family, and I believe in McDonald's hamburgers. But then he made a tragic statement. He said, but when I go to the office on Monday, that order is reversed. Isn't that sad? Isn't that heartbreaking? Thank God Daniel wasn't that way. The Bible says, as was his, he said, don't you pray anymore. King said, don't pray anymore. If you do, we're gonna throw you into a den of lions. But the Bible says, as was his custom, as was normal, he got by the window and sought God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hey, you, you, you're you gonna bow down to us and we're not bowing down. And let me just tell you, you do whatever it is you wanna do, king, we're still gonna serve God. Isn't that a powerful, powerful expression? Isaiah said, I set my face like a flint. Peter and John says, we're not gonna stop preaching. We can't help but to preach and to teach that which we have seen and that which we have heard. In other words, we wanna be wholeheartedly committed to the Lord. A friend of mine in 1984 penned this prayer. Today he is dying uh, with Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, but he penned this. I, I thought it was powerful. I, I'm going to take just a minute and run overboard on my time for a second. But I, I think it's important you hear it. Lord, I am a furnace, burn within me. I am a letter, mail me anywhere you like. I am a scythe, use me to harvest whomever, whenever. I'm an arrow, point me and shoot me anywhere you like. I'm oil, point, pour on me the wounds of hurting world. I'm a rocket, launch me to your destination. I am a missile, use me to hit your target. I'm a car, drive me as long and as far as you like. I'm a rake, drag me across a dirty world. I'm an ear, Lord, use me to hear the hurts of people. Lord, I'm a bandage, use me to cover the lacerations of humanity. I'm a bell, Lord, ring me as loud and as long as you wish. I'm a bridge, use me to connect broken relations. I am a socket, plug me into anything you want to run. I am a knife, sharpen and cut out of me anything that is rotten and mundane. I am a hammer, weld me and break me into pieces, my arrogance and my prejudices. I am elastic, stretch and wrap me around anyone or anything to hold together that which is falling apart. I am available, O oh Lord. I am a shovel, dig with me till every root of bitterness is gone. I'm a magnet, Lord, draw with me any that are weak and heavy laden. I am a cup, fill me, empty me, store me, display me, or use me for your highest. Oh, Lord, I stand before you as a trigger. Place your finger on me and pull as a bullet of love and tenderness. Aim me at a broken life and let me penetrate the hurt and loneliness of despair. Oh, Lord, as an eraser on the end of a pencil, rub me firmly across the mistakes of this life to remove from the ledger the arrows that glare. Lord, as a ball of twine, tie me around anything or anyone that's falling apart. As a tube of glue, use me to put together again all that are broken. As a saw, O oh Lord, use me to rip up the twin boards of selfishness and inwardness that they may be used as kindling. As a match, strike me now to melt the hardness and coldness of others, to light a darkened room, or to just set a fire ablazing. I am a pen, Lord. Write with me the message of salvation again and again for all to read. As a truck, Lord, drive me loaded with a cargo for a needy world whenever and wherever is needed. Thread me and use me to mend broken relationships as a needle. Relationships have ripped up marriages and severed allegiances. As a bottle of spot remover, Lord, remove my lid and pour me on a sin-soiled world. 
And now, as perfume, spray me lavishly in those areas of life made foul by the odors of sin. Lord, I am available. Use me wholeheartedly. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.